This has got to be one of the weirdest things I've ever done. Did you always have the kind of confidence to be able to sit here and interview yourself like some narcissist? I was just a nervous kid. I was shy. I didn't talk to people that much. I didn't have many friends outside of school. A lot of what I was doing was just totally driven by fear. And I think that carried on, to be honest, until my mid-twenties. I'm on bonus because I never thought I'd do any of the things I'm doing. This is insane that I've ever got here. I really believe that in 30 years time, we've gonna made a huge difference and a huge impact. And that's what I measure myself on. I didn't measure myself on the day today. I measure myself on the 30 year impact. And we're live. Today we've got a special edition of the podcast where I'm gonna be interviewing myself because we had a last minute guest cancellation and the show must go on. So what I'm gonna try and give you here is obviously I know my own story. But I tried to do it in a way that's hopefully fun and engaging and you get to learn a bit more about my story and maybe some of the things I haven't really talked about publicly before or on the Bay HQ. So I'm Amma, I'm the guy who's always behind the seat and asking the questions. But today I ask the same questions I ask my guests to me. So I'm now going to put my interviewer hat. So if you're watching this on YouTube, this is Amma, the interviewer, and this is Amma, the guest. So Amma. You've got an interesting story. Tell me about when you're growing up, what did you want to be? It's funny in a way because my story actually has gone full circle. When I was growing up, I wish I wanted to be an author, right? So I was thinking in my head, I was maybe five, six years old, I was thinking, I want to write books. Then I forgot about that for about two decades or a decade and a half. And later on, I became a writer, right? But growing up when I was at school, I was, what I like to call it is like a ronin, right? So people aren't familiar with samurai culture. Samurais always have a master, whereas a ronin is a samurai without a master. So it's somebody who has skill, they're good at things, but they don't really know where to apply it. They don't have a mission. And I think that's what I was like. I was like, most stuff I do, I get engaged in, I get obsessed with, I get good at, I had that kind of a personality. And as well to sound arrogant either, I was plenty of stuff I wasn't very good at, but I never really knew what I wanted to do. And I did this whole thing where I picked the A-levels, I picked A-levels of biology, chemistry, maths, and economics. Basically the typical brown thing to do because I didn't know what I wanted to do, right? I didn't know if I wanted to become a doctor dentist or if I wanted to go down the more businessy route. And I thought about it in my head is that because I'm not passionate enough about medicine, about that kind of an industry, I shouldn't go into it. So me choosing economics was yes, I was interested in it. But it was also me kicking the can down the road in terms of decision-making. That's interesting. and. What were you like as a kid? Did you always have the kind of confidence to be able to sit here and interview yourself like some narcissist or you struggling a bit more of your confidence? I can confidently say until this morning, I never thought I'd be sitting here into myself, but such is life and I am doing what I'm doing. But to be honest, as a kid, I didn't speak like this, right? I spoke like this and burn yeah, well gone because I didn't have that confidence. I was trying to fit in and even now, like again, we'll get we'll give you a few secrets because it's a weird episode. And if you're listening, then you can enjoy it, right? That I used to be really jumpy. So obviously going to an all-boys school, there was lots of people play fighting and stuff like that. And I used to really jump and people would make fun of me for it, right? Because I always had this anxiety where I didn't quite feel like I fit in, I wasn't that cool. And that was always something which I was just a nervous kid. I was shy. I didn't talk to people that much. I didn't have many friends outside of school. I was part of clubs and stuff, but then at the same time, I might be friends of one or two people, but I was never like the extrovert. I was never the person who was really outgoing and found it really easy to make friends and command an audience. So the fact I'm doing what I do today is a massive surprise to me more than anybody else. And I also think like at that stage, a lot of what I was doing was just totally driven by fear. And I think that carried on to be honest until my mid twenties that I was just so insecure. I was just doing things just because I needed achievements to look cool or to look impressive. And obviously nobody really cares about that stuff, but I always had to do these achievements and have these ambitions and these goals and these titles just to kind of prove my value to other people, even though the actual other people didn't really perceive them as anything. Like they'd rather just chat rather than like, oh, this, 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 whatever, right? So yeah, as a kid, I was very nervous, very shy. I was the kind of person where if, I trusted you, I might never shut up, which is still the case, obviously. But for me to now go to what I'm doing, be able to talk to so many people, was just never something I really ever thought I'd be doing. And if I look back, it's just kind of surreal to me that I'm now 
in this position where a lot of people believe I'm confident because it is something which very much grew over time. So you said you chose economics because you weren't sure what you wanted to do with your life and that was a way to kick the can down the road. When you got to university, did you then have a good idea? What was it that at university you're thinking, this is the future for me? Did you ever think one day you'd be working for yourself? The idea of running my business never came into my head at university. It was just not something that people like us do, right? That people like me do, that anybody in my friendship group did. I studied economics, everybody's thinking about banking, consulting, those kind of professional careers. The idea was to go to the city, make a ton of money and retire early, which obviously most people don't really do. And in my head, what I was always thinking is that I'd go and do teaching. So I had this weird delusion in my head. By the time I'm 30, I have a million dollars, a million pounds in the bank, and I'd go and quit my job, become a teacher. Because to me, teaching is a job that has a lot of meaning, and it still does. I think I really respect teachers because I know they make a huge difference, and there's so much impact that can be made for young people. And if you do it at that stage, it sets them up for the rest of their life. Whereas it's a lot harder, although it's possible, to make those changes and interventions later on in life. So it's one of the reasons why with what we're doing today, we're going to go into schools, we're going to go into university because I want to give people that step up. But yeah, that was my idea. And the way I was going to make that million pounds as well was to be, it was through investing, through trading. So obviously economics degree, I was investing my money that I was making from like my jobs in the summers and things like that. And that was going to enable me to then make it rich, right? Because what I was going to do in my delusions, and I still have these delusions quite often, daydreams I like to call them, where I'd make a deal and then that company would go 300% and then all of a sudden I'd be rich and then I'd be like, that's what I used to think where it would be be dreamland. It wouldn't be that this would actually ever happen. But I used to think like, oh, one day I'd do this, one day I'd do this. And it was kind of like, oh, it's, so I've got a martial arts background, right, with karate. And then I'd imagine myself being like a superhero and it's lame as hell to say that, but it's the truth, right? Where I'd imagine myself being the national champ, like the champion of the world. And I used to de- dream a lot. I was always a dreamer, but I didn't really take the steps or believe that I could actually ever make it. So I'd live in those dreams, right? I'd live in those dreams that I could be super popular, that I could be super successful. But in reality, I kind of knew I didn't, I what well, in reality, I thought I didn't have that initiative. I didn't think I could do those things. So that's why I dreamt about it but didn't necessarily take the steps to actually get there. Yeah, so that is an interesting revelation about you there, about these dreams and ambitions and these kind of wild, crazy theories. And hopefully nobody makes fun of you from that, from listening to this. But you mentioned there about martial arts in particular. And obviously I know, but did that have a big impact on you? What did martial arts do for you and your confidence? I'd say karate is a massive reason why I am who I am today, because it gave me a lot more confidence in myself, a lot more belief in myself. So we're talking about a kid who was scared of his own shadow, right? So I was growing up around people in Ilford. And for me, it was always a, a fear of violence, even if there wasn't necessarily a reality of it. And it's this whole thing about we create these worries in our mind, right? And I think I had so many worries and I was just paranoid about everything. And people obviously knew me back then. They could agree with that, right? Like I didn't want to hide that. Like I wasn't a cool kid. I wasn't popular. I wasn't anything like that. And I'd get nervous about things that other people just didn't get nervous about. And karate was my release. It was a huge thing for me in terms of confidence because here was something which I became good at, which eventually I became in the national squad of. And having that ability and that just self-confidence in myself that I can deal with situations, I can deal with danger, that is a huge part of who I am today. And I think anybody listening who struggles with confidence or they have children or they have Young people, they know that struggle with confidence. Martial arts is such a huge help and it gives you that discipline and that structure. And you can even see it in the way I am today, right? That martial arts background is a big reason why I can just look at anything and look straight into the camera and be like, I can take it on, right? I believe in myself. I'm going to smash it. Because if you can take on different things in the world where you're, well, you can in training where your back is against the wall and you're getting these people who are world-class martial artists trying to hit you in the face, when you can deal with that, that just gave me the belief I can take on anything. Okay, so let's let's fast forward a bit, right? Let's fast forward through your, your journey. So what did you go into after university? So after university, I actually went into tech consulting and it wasn't intentional. And I've gone from the company now, so I can admit this, but I thought it was gonna be more business consulting, right? I thought it was gonna be more strategy consultant, management consulting. And I thought it'd be some elements of tech. And in the end, it was way more technical than I thought it was gonna be. But at the same time, once I got into that role and I got steady in it, 
it was then hard to leave because it's like, well, I've built up skills in this area now. I don't really want to go back to ground zero and start my career again. So it was one of these situations where even though I knew I didn't want to do it long term, I stuck around. And one thing was I really liked the people there and I really enjoyed my bosses. They were great people. And I obviously appreciate it more now sitting on this other side where I'm not there anymore. And I maybe didn't give them enough credit when I did work there. And I think naturally an employee, sometimes it's hard to get empathy with people who are the bosses, right? Because you think in your head that they've made it. They know everything what to do, right? Whereas once you become what I've done today and what I've talked to all these different entrepreneurs, I realize just how tough it is and how many different trade-offs I have to make all the time. So I've got such massive respect for my former bosses at Box Fusion, and that's Chris and Andy. So shout out to them if they're listening to this. So I was there for seven years. I always had something on the side. So I did, like I used to travel a lot and the traveling was because I needed something to look forward to because I didn't know where I was going in life. And that anxiety and that stress, despite me being maybe more confident than I was when I was younger, it just had this void inside of me, right? Like, what am I going to do? Like, I need to, again, a huge amount of my life when I was younger was led by me not being confident and me needing to collect trophies or collect achievements or collect cool things so that I could feel like I belonged in different situations, right? Because I didn't feel like I was, yeah, I, I guess I didn't feel like I was cool. I didn't, I needed these things to give me that confidence, which is obviously, in hindsight, not particularly good and not particularly healthy. So I also danced in a national bunga competition, right? So there's only one competition a year. So calling it the national is a bit of a exaggeration there. But I danced front of the stage in front of 2000 people. And I'd always have these things on the side as projects that were to pour my creativity into it, right? And what was great about my job in the end was that because it was tech consulting, it meant that I had both the technical skills, problem solving skills that have been a massive help to me, but also the people skills and the ability to break down quite complicated technical things into language that everybody understands. And that skill is basically the foundations of storytelling, right? Consultants who aren't just making slide decks, at least, it's how do you weave the story of here's what's crap going on that the client doesn't really care about. They care about the outcomes and how it's going to affect their customers and their bottom line. So how do you create that bond to them? And I think that's something which I did very well is that I was able to do the technical side and problem solving, whatever, but I was able to build a rapport with the clients so that because I could do that communication well, they helped me out a lot because I could manage those relationships and keep the project on budget. And often I like to say, I used to like to over promise, but then over deliver, deliver where I could do things quicker than they thought I could do them, but I'd still be able to have time to do that. So I love the honesty so far about some of the challenges you faced and also about some of your motivation. Because I think sometimes, often people, they like to come on here, maybe they try to show themselves perfect the whole way through. And I know it's definitely not the case for you. So tell us about the writing side of things, right? Because that's initially how you built your brand. Although a lot of people maybe who are part of the Bay HQ or follow this channel, aren't really aware of the origins of where that writing came from. I think a big transition for me came when I was in my mid 20s, right? I think I started to understand a lot more about how actually mental health is a thing and mental well-being. And I think I'd grown up in this situation where, I okay, guess toxic masculinity, whatever it was, where if somebody was struggling mentally, then that just made them weak, right? And that's what I kind of grew up believing and thinking. And that's a product of my school environment, different places I'd been, whatever. But I started to have more people open up to me and I started to realise there's a lot of people who I think are so successful and so popular and so cool at what I desired to be maybe, who actually had a lot of problems underneath the covers. And that opened my eyes a lot because I started to realize actually, maybe there's things that I've been struggling with that I've been covering up and trying to pretend I'm confident when I'm not really. And maybe that's actually okay. And I think once you can admit that there's things that you can work on and improve on, then that enables you to really grow. So I started reading a lot. So I say 26, 27, 28, I was reading a book a week almost, right? So I used to love reading stories about people from other backgrounds, people who didn't have the same life experiences as me. And this reading habit eventually came to the idea of like, well, why don't I write something? I've learned so much in the last couple of years. Maybe I can share my ideas and it's going to help me process my thoughts. So January 2020, New Year's resolution, I'll start writing online. Nobody's going to care, but it would be good for me, right? And new year, new me, productive habit, whatever, right? And that's the kind of angle I went at it from. And my first article went viral and then the rest kind of became history, right? So that was January 2020, March 2020, the pandemic started. 
all of a sudden I was at home way more often. I had a lot more time to write. I was getting traction. I was getting people liking what I was doing. And it was really giving that, me that purpose, right? I was, I'm good at something and people like it. And that was that feedback loop that really spurred me on. It was just really enjoyable to have discovered this skill, which I didn't really know I had. And I always say to people, if you're not happy or you've got different things going on and you feel like you're in a rut, just try something out. You don't know what it's going to be that's going to be the magic bullet. For me, writing made a huge difference. But it could be something else for you. Maybe you find out you're a good painter. Maybe you find out you're good at something else. Maybe it's a different type of dance, whatever it is. From there, it became the Editor of Entrepreneurs Handbook six months later. And it was a weirdly quick rise. But it was because I was interacting with people. I was trying to help people out. People who were a lot more experienced than I did saw that. And they saw that I was giving quite good advice and helping people out. So they took me under their wing, a guy called Michael Thompson. So shout out to Michael. He took me under his wing. And then I then became the editor of Entrepreneur's Handbook with him. And that enabled me to suddenly rapidly increase my growth because now I'm editing all these entrepreneurs from all across the world. So Entrepreneur's Handbook, we used to get a couple million views a month in that a couple million views a month in the summer of 2020. And my own writing was starting to get to kind of level as well. I was getting a million views a month. And it was just so weird because I never thought myself ever like that. That wasn't the ambition. I didn't start writing to become rich and I didn't start writing to quit my job and do it. And I think a lot of people ask me the wrong question. A lot of people ask me, I want to become a full-time content creator someday. How do I do it? Well, they should be asking me, how do you start? How do you get the first steps? And even then, you shouldn't be asking me. You should just Google it. Just start. That's the best advice I have possibly for anybody who wants to become a content creator. Just start. Stop overthinking it. I've had so many pivots over time. Most people don't remember my early articles. Most people don't remember what I did two years ago. That's fine. You can start now. It can be crap. It can be rubbish. But you get that muscle. You start to improve. You can pivot later on if you want to. So by the end of the year, I was starting to out-earn my day job from the writing. So Medium is a platform I use. Medium is just like YouTube for writing. So you get paid based on the amount of views and the readership time, right? Same exact same thing, watch time that I did, right? What's happening? I'm starting to now consistently beat my day job with income. And at the same time, it's exciting me. I'm getting fulfillment. I'm getting the challenge. And with work, I'm like, I'm good at this, but I don't see where it's going to go. A lot of people are now asking me, when are you going to go full time? And the demand for calls, the people adding me on LinkedIn, the people emailing me like, oh, blah, 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 blah. I couldn't keep up with it, right? So as the pandemic was starting to come to an end and things started to open up again, I had to decide to myself, I've got three things, right? So you've got, there's, there's three things I had. I had social life, work, and side hustles. And I couldn't maintain all three. During the pandemic, I had no social life. Easy. Okay, cool. I've got work and side hustles. That's it. Once things started opening up again, I want a social life, right? Do I want to sacrifice the social life for these things? I was forced into that position. So I had to decide work, side hustles, right? Because I couldn't maintain both and have a life and not lose it, right? And I am currently interviewing myself, so maybe you can argue that I have lost it, but here we are. So work was one that I thought I'd regret the least. And what I'd say is a huge impact is that the people around me believed in me, especially my parents, especially my dad and my mum, right? And my sisters too. So I took a week off in February and I sat down and made a plan of exactly what I was going to do when I quit my job. I was really overthinking it. And I think to honest, it's a good idea to overthink it. But I had the savings. I had money in the bank. If I failed, I failed and I'd be able to find something again right but my dad just believed in me so much he was just like just quit like stop overthinking it you'll be fine I trust in you I believe in you right and that is like turning point right if he'd said to me you're being an idiot don't quit your job I don't know if I would have I don't know if I'd be here today if my dad didn't believe in me if my family didn't say like yeah you're good you're gonna do this right because the amount of imposter syndrome that comes with like yeah I'm gonna become a full-time writer after having my whole identity based around being in the professional career and being working in the city, it was really quite, di like, it was really difficult for me. It was nightmares. It was not being able to sleep for months. It would be crying. Like I would, like I'm not ashamed to admit that, in those months of my notice period, I was just like all over the place. Like I was so scared. And now I can't even remember having a day job. So what actually happened when you quit your job, right? Because you don't really write very much anymore, right? So you quit your job to become a writer who doesn't write. And now you just podcast mainly. What, what do you actually do now? So it's interesting. I quit my job for the personal brand, right? So my personal brand was growing and I thought, okay, people are coming to me for me. But once you quit your job, you want safety. So what I was doing then is taking a lot more client work. So I was writing for startups all across the world, some of the biggest names. I can't name them for NDA reasons, but companies worth in your 
tens of billions, hundreds of billions of range, right? And many startups that were smaller than that, founders, don't believe anything you read on the internet is written by somebody like me. And that earned significant money in that year, right? So, but it became like a job. So I quit my job to believe in myself and back myself. And now a lot of my writing was actually not even under my own name. and Nobody knew I wrote it. But what I did do in that year is experiment a lot. So the first thing I did, once I went full time, I started a podcast, which a lot of people don't know about. I don't even advertise this one anymore, called Mindful and Driven. And the idea there, because a lot of my writing at the time, was all about how to find balance, <laughs> which is ironic now, considering the lack of balance I have. But that's what I was really obsessed with at the time. That's what I was really interested in. So I was interviewing people who'd done very well and to my like their routine, how do they simultaneously have the drive to succeed and to do well while also looking after themselves and having that self-care? And again, the irony is that I don't look after myself anymore, right? And that's something I'm really trying to put into place better. So that podcast started and I then started Entrepreneur's Handbook podcast as well. So that one's had like founder of Netflix, founder of Twitter, those kinds of people. And it was just a sudden explosion of like all of a sudden I'm all over the place. I'm doing these different things, experimenting. And that first year was intentional of I'm doing a bunch of different things, find out what I enjoy and keep doing more of what I enjoy. That was the idea. Just allow myself to be curious. Don't put too much pressure on the financial side or anything like that. Although I did end up spending a lot more time on the financial side than I wanted to, just because I'm human and it's nice to see money coming into the bank, right? Okay, so rewind a second there. You said that you interviewed the founders and everything on Twitter. How was that experience? What did that do for you? Okay, so now including this podcast, I've interviewed over about 220 people. And the top guns, the people like the founders of Netflix, the founders of Twitter, they're all human. Like, they all eat, they all sleep, they all shit. And because of that experience of me talking to some of these people now, I think my personality is very different of... I try to show respect to everybody. I also have a lot less time for ego. I just can't be asked. Like there are plenty of people now who think I should be talking in a certain way or think I should suck up to them. And it's like the people who I've met at the very, very top, your Ev Williams of Twitter, your Mark Randolph of Netflix, they were so kind. And that's what kind of person I want to be. And I'm not there yet, right? I am struggling with my different things. I haven't got the balance. I'm out of whack, right? And I want to be better. And I want to be able to manage that better because at the moment it's it's tough right like I'm juggling so many different things sometimes I'm not fully present sometimes there's some mistakes and I want to improve on that and those people and like same my dad right my dad was really really good at being present in the moment and it's something I need to work on but yeah that's the huge biggest thing I learned is that these guys all have regrets the billions doesn't make you happy and although the idea is about scale is like people think the idea is to create a billion dollar company to become rich for a lot of these people, it's actually motivated by it because what are you going to buy with a billion dollars? The, what the actual motivation is, is they really care about the problem they're trying to solve and they're obsessed with they enjoy the actual process of what they're doing. There's a, a certain level you're motivated by money and then another level where you're just motivated by like, this is fun. So say Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett enjoys picking stocks. He enjoys that whole process. Mark Randolph enjoyed finding problems to fix. Ev Williams, he was fascinated with this idea of communication online and how do we creates spaces where it furthers humanity right and that's what I learned from these guys is that one I believe myself a lot more because like they're all cool they're all very intelligent but they're all just human also to try and be aware of what's the actual point of this right because I don't think I was ever really motivated by money but money obviously makes things a lot easier and money is a privilege that enables you to build what you want to build because you don't need to worry about the bills and a lot of people don't realize how big a privilege that is where if you're a successful entrepreneur, but then if you knew at any time you could go back to live with your parents and your parents would just cover your costs for however long you wanted to, that gives you a different level of risk appetite. Whereas if somebody else has got a nine to five and if they don't make their mortgage, like if they don't make enough money one month, then they default on their house. It's not a fair comparison. And that's why I try to spotlight where I can people who did come from nothing and made it themselves because I think that's really inspiring. And I think there's an incredible number of people who've done that. So far in this story, I haven't heard anything about the Bay HQ yet, right? So where did the Bay HQ come into things? What was the story behind that? So the Bay HQ story starts from me wanting to get a bit more involved in the UK scene, because I was very, very heavily American based and Americans eight hours behind in Silicon Valley, which is a massive pain. Sorry, Americans, but it's true. And I was looking at this now of how can I make a difference here? Where can I find a niche? And what I did is I gave a talk for EY and happened to be, so somebody I used to dance with, Ramvir, her husband, now Gervir, it became my co-founder. 
And it, it was all because I did a talk there. I said, if anybody knows anybody I should interview, let me know for the entrepreneur's handbook. She said, oh, my husband's invented capital. He will know some people you should interview. So we had a chat. We got along. We went for a Malaysian. I can't remember the name of the place now. Somewhere in Foundon. And we just had a rant. And then we met again a couple of weeks later. We had another rant. And then we're thinking, wait, why don't we do something about this? Because he's got a venture capital background. Venture capital, again, for people is like investing other people's money in startups, basically. So we had that experience. I had the experience in the media side. Let's do something together and let's see if we can do it, right? So it's really fun to think of the idea. It's like for people who haven't been into business yet, that ideation stage is so fun where you're just thinking, like, okay, what can we do? What can we do? And it was trying to work out exactly what Anish was going to be as well, right? Because you've got, we could have gone for Sikhs, both Sikh. We could have gone for Indians. We could have gone for Punjabis. We could have gone for Asians, South Asians. And we decided to go broader because Asians, because we thought we want to make the maximum impact. And also there's a lot of challenges that Asians face that is common between them, but they don't work together. So we want to change that mentality, right? We want Muslims to work with Hindus. We want like Indians to work with Chinese people. We want people from Japan to work with people from Bangladesh. We want all of those kind of, um, we want all of those relationships to be built up. But at this point, it was still an idea to be a side hustle. How I actually came up with the name is we were sitting, well, I was sitting in a conference. I was bored out of my mind. I was daydreaming. I do this quite a lot, to be honest. And it's like, okay, British Asian entrepreneur, that's really long. Then it's like BAE. Then it's like, oh, Bay. Oh, Bay's quite funny. And Obviously, as you can see on my T-shirt now, that's what we went with. And it's interesting because obviously a lot of people ask about it. And it was just it's just a tongue-in-cheek brand, right? And I think hopefully it gets people, it's easy to remember. It's fun. It's short. All the domains were available. All of the Instagrams were available. And that made it happen at that stage. And so this is obviously where the heart of it sort of comes about. So dad fell sick. And I've talked about this before, so I won't go into too much detail right now. I think it's a story that people may have heard if you listen to previous episodes. Uh, previous episodes. So dad passed away in August 7th last year, and it flipped everything on his head, right? Because in that year beforehand, I was driven by curiosity. I was driven by, here's something cool I can do. Let's try this. Let's try that. It was very exciting. It's like the world of opportunity just opened up to me. But the problem is that curiosity, when you've had a loss like that, nothing is interesting anymore. Nothing, well, it took a lot out of me and it still takes a lot out of me. Like I've got chunks of me missing, right? And what I knew at that stage is that I needed something to overwhelm that grief. I needed something where I cared about so much that enables me to just distract myself, to overpower, because it's just not, it's not fun feeling sad, right? And I also knew that a lot of people turn to drugs, a lot of people turn to alcohol, a lot of people turn to vices that aren't particularly healthy. And I was thinking, if what if I turn it to a not-for-profit and focus my energy towards something that's going to help people and obsess over that, then it's probably the least of the evils. It's still not the best thing to do, but this is my logic. Don't necessarily recommend it. And that's what I did, right? And even thinking back on it now, like really thinking about it, I threw myself in really early. Like within a month or so, I was doing interviews again. And part of it was just, I can't explain the effect that the grief had on me, where it was just tingling like it was just on edge like you know when in the movies we can see something bad is about to happen it just felt like that all the time right so I needed something to focus myself on that would be positive and just throw myself into work mode and really hard and that first couple months after the funeral after things got set up again to say I want to say it was like mid-September to say well even to like the end of the year I had events pretty much every day sometimes multiple events a day because all I was doing was just avoiding constantly avoiding and I was open about it I was telling people that this was happened blah blah blah. I was justifying and deluding myself that I'm okay because I'm talking about it I'm telling people what's going on at the same time as being so burnt out that I could just barely cope but the thing is if I rested then I'd think about what's going on so I just avoided and avoided 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 and a lot of this year same thing right like so the Bay HQ podcast is an obvious bit because I've done a lot of podcasts it was quite easy for me I've done I'm comfortable with this, clearly, right? But then there's so much more than that. It was about the, doing events and doing community. And there's so many other aspects we have and we're still trying to build out. And next week's episode, you'll hear a lot more about what we're doing there. So I'm going to get too much detail. But it was this whole new project and this whole new thing that I really believe that in 30 years' time, we've going to made a huge difference and a huge impact. And that's what I measure myself on. I don't measure myself on the day-to-day. -day. I measure myself on the 30-year impact. And that sucks in terms of most people is that 
you celebrate your wins, right? I don't celebrate my wins. And it's partly because of grief, it's partly because of different things. But I'm very much becoming like a machine. And when people wonder how this has grown so quickly as it has in the last year, it's because of the huge amount of sacrifice that's gone behind it. And I need to prepare and look after myself a lot more. Because right? I want a 30 year impact. 30 year impact doesn't work if I burn out and break down in the next year, right? What have been some of the highlights of this journey so far? And what have been some of the struggles you've had? What have been the most difficult moments? In terms of highlights, we had a launch party at Borden's Capital. I've had some incredible people on this podcast. I won't try to name any because there's too many incredible people. And I'm truly privileged to have talked to the people I have and get to do what I get to do. And I am grateful for that. That makes a huge difference. And it is like, who am I to be doing this? Right? I always ask myself, who am I, right? And I try to do things in the right way. It doesn't mean I'm always right. It doesn't mean I don't regret things. It doesn't mean I wish. I always wish I was better, right? There's always this drive inside of me of trying to be better and I fall short sometimes. But we've also just done great things in terms of like how we've had on guests, who we've had events with, the people that support us, the people that show us love, the people that reach out and message. Like, I know we're making an impact. I know it's making a difference. I know we're way beyond what I ever dreamed we could ever do. And I always say that like I'm on bonus because I never thought I'd do any of the things I'm doing. If I fail today, then at least I've got a good story for my grandkids because this is all bonus. This is honestly like so surreal and I know there's so much more I've got to give and I know there's so much more I'm going to do but sometimes I do have to appreciate this is insane that I've ever got here and then the low lights so there are many low lights the funding side has been a lot harder than we thought it was going to be and that was kind of a naivety and to be honest we haven't actually pitched a huge number of people because we've had really positive conversations with everybody but closing that deal is really difficult so they might do normal starter. They might talk to a couple hundred investors to get it sorted. And we're trying to do that while also building the company. And that's very difficult to both do simultaneously doing sponsorship talks while also building the company. Because if you don't do enough building the company, then you don't have the results to then bring on the sponsors. And it's kind of a catch-22, right? And I can turn on the charisma with what I do. I have to do this all the time. I'm sitting here talking to myself for an hour like an absolute weirdo, knowing this is going to go on YouTube, on Apple, wherever, and people can watch this and judge me. I'm used to that. But the challenge for me is, is that a lot of people think I'm more confident. No, not that I'm more confident than I am, but that they don't realize the struggle that it is in terms of the grief side of things. They think, okay, a couple months is gone. Where it's waves. Like sometimes like June, July, August was tough. Like I was just out of it. I was just like, even you can probably still hear it in my voice today. And I can turn it on like this, right? It's like, welcome to the podcast. Today we have with us, blah, blah, blah. But it's not the day-to-day, -day, right? The moments of quiet when I have to reflect and just miss things going on and just you wish sometimes things were easier, but they're not, right? And instead I built the resilience to be able to deal with things. So for me, like a couple of the lowlights is just dealing with the grief. And there was, when I did the NAV podcast recording the live audience, Again, incredible that I even get to talk to a guy like Nap. He's amazing what he's on the washing machine project. But that was three days off my dad's death anniversary. So I felt like zero, right? And I had to turn on this charisma and people were complimenting me off. It's like, oh, but you managed that conversation so well. It's like, it worries me that I can turn on that when I feel broken inside. So that's something I'm working on and I'm trying to clear up. And it's now this case of how do I, how do I scale this? How do we get this bigger and bigger while at the same time reduce the sacrifice and reduce the amount it takes out of me. So we've now run out of time of you talking to yourself. So thank you so much for coming on and hopefully this has been an enjoyable episode for the audience. And if not, you've made it this far. Hello, hello everyone. Thank you so much for listening. It means a huge amount to us. And we don't think you realise how important you are. Because if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, if you leave us a five star review, it makes a world of difference. And if you believe in what we're trying to do here, to inspire, connect and guide the next generation British Asians, if you do those things, you can help us achieve that mission. And you can help us make a bigger impact. And by doing that, it means we can get bigger guests, we can host more events, we can do more for the community. So you can play a huge part. So thank you so much for supporting us.